My name is Stanley Mwenda Aruyaru. Stanley Mwenda Aruyaru is a doctor with over 12 years of experience in the Kenyan healthcare space. In terms of specialization, I'm a general and laparoscopic surgeon, and I practice as the chief medical officer and a general surgeon in PCA Kikuyu Hospital, which is a level five faith-based facility in Kenya. I also serve as the secretary general of the Surgical Society of Kenya, which is the umbrella association that brings together all the surgeons of the country to just chart the way forward in terms of how we can make uh, surgical care better. Besides surgery and medicine and management, I am also an author. My book is titled The Chronicles of a Village Surgeon. I used to go with the tagline village surgeon because I practiced for long in rural Kenya. Until now I decided to change that a little in terms of uh, branding and uh, therefore I refer to myself as doing surgery and more. And therefore I package my work in this healthcare space through three words s o w s is for speaking o is for operating and w is for writing i am a national asset i must serve every corner of the kenya mm -hmm. because that area that doesn't have a doctor is not is is is, is not by their doing but that is the height of upper bid we have in the healthcare system if you look at the 2022 kenya medical practitioners and dentist council database Nairobi County has four, over 4,000 doctors. Samburu County has two. How do you work like that? One of the critical documents that, that people run away from and people are always afraid to sign is the consent form. Very many people fear because it always looks like, eh -heh, could you sign? death warrant yeah, um, to. it always looks like wow, wow 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 you're the one who is charged with the responsibility to, de to determine but quickly just tell us how important is a consent form what is the content of a consent form and and why shouldn't somebody be worried by just consenting and who is supposed to sign the consent form thank you mike uh, that's a very very important document we say surgery without consent is assault so if 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 even if your leg is crooked and I'm coming to put it straight, if I do it and you never give me the go ahead, you can sue me for injuring you. Because essentially surgery is injury. You cause a little more injury to correct an old injury or take care of a growth or something like that. So consent is one of those very important documents that we shouldn't operate any patient without because it forms the it is the documentary evidence that you agreed for this to happen. Now, consent is not just for surgery. You will see when you get into a hospital, you might actually have a general consent that says, this is how we work here. We will give you drugs that we feel are best. We might do this, we might do this, and you consent to that. But when you are going to surgery, then the consent has certain areas that are mandatory. But the first thing to say is it's called informed consent. It is not induced consent. It is not coerced consent. It is informed consent. What information must you have as a patient? Now, when it comes to information, what information does the doctor give you? The doctor tells you what the problem is. So there will be a slot where we write diagnosis. Maybe you have a broken limb, it means fixing. That tells you what is the surgery that is going to be done. So we are going to do surgery called XYZ to correct this problem. What are the benefits? Because if surgery is not beneficial, then it should not be done. It's not post-mortem. So the benefits must be shared. Then the risks. And I think this is where patients zone off completely. They just remember the doctor said I might die. The doctor said I might bleed out. The doctor said I might get infection. But usually we mention that not because it happens to everyone, because it happens to a few, but for the few that it happens to them, it is life and death. To them, it is 100%. So the risks associated with the procedure must be mentioned. But the other bit that sometimes we don't emphasize, and if you look at some consent they might not have, is what we call the alternatives. So are there alternatives? Including if I don't have surgery, what will happen? So then the doctor should be able to tell you, if you don't have surgery, you might die. If you don't have surgery, you might get paralyzed. If you don't have surgery now, your leg might rot away and get cut off. All those things. If you don't have surgery, there might actually be nothing wrong. You will just end up with your lump. Like if someone has a lump on their forehead, they want to remove that it's not cancerous, I will tell them. If you don't have surgery, nothing wrong will happen. You will just remain with your lump. 
etc etc so that is the information that must be packaged in our consent but there's a prerequisite even before we can get the point of information is the patient of sound mind so that usually is the starting point mm. i have assessed this patient they are of sound mind or they are confused therefore their next of kin that is their spouse or their son is giving the consent on their behalf so that bit also needs to be captured because i cannot discuss with you about going through a surgery when you're confused you don't even understand what i'm talking to you about so when all this has been discussed and agreed then we go to the consenting part and you usually have the patient consenting the surgeon consenting and a witness usually the witness might be any other member of healthcare who is there and they say i have seen you explain you've signed even the part that the patient signs of it says the doctor has explained to me the benefit of the surgery the risks involved the alternatives and therefore i choose to agree to proceed with surgery and then that is signed off so that in a nutshell is what the informed consent is about because it guides the professionalism it guides me that i cannot just you know start doing surgery and decide to extend and do something extra just because i feel ah me naona ni mbaya acha tuende like i wanted to go and to really clean up the leg but i realized ah this leg needs to be cut and then i just say see see we are in theater so we do it one one off so that it doesn't come again i must confine myself to what we agreed i'm going to do of course there is always a caveat that in the event there is a life threatening complication then it is only seen that the doctor acts in the best interest of saving the patient's life and if that means an extra procedure that you are not aware of the part of this package is if the doctor assesses that now we have a bad complication the only way to deal with it is this they will do it but they will document and come tell you look as 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 you can see the fine print here says if i find your life is at risk when i'm operating and the only way to save your life is to do this extra part of procedure that i did not discuss with you it is part of the package so i think the just the mere seriousness of surgery and the unknown and the fear is what makes patients forget what was in the informed consent but it is okay to even carry it home it, it is allowable carry your consent home go read it we feel it carry it home go read it come back we sign before we go to surgery because then you will have slept over it read again slept over it and you have all the questions you need to ask because by the time you are signing it is informed informed means you have asked all the questions and i have answered them Yeah. Yes. Now we want to dive straight into the chronicles of a village surgeon. Yes. And um what were the thoughts behind you curating and uh, saying now I want to write a book? Very very interesting. This is how it started. I belong to a group called Toastmasters International. Toastmasters International is an organization that enables people to become better communicators, better leaders and all that. So when you get into Toastmasters International every meeting you can deliver a speech or you can take a leadership position during that meeting and that's how you grow and there is a curriculum and I remember back in 2018 one of the modules was there is a module by the way called I was starting a podcast so there was a module called write a compelling blog and I decided what is that that is so easy you know the low hanging fruit that i can write about i can write about the cases i see every day and that project required me to write eight blogs in two weeks and then come back and speak in my club give a speech about what i have learned through doing that blog so i made sure my website was working and i just started writing the blogs and over time i had those eight blogs and i gave my speech and i said i am done with this and then i asked myself so what So because the culture and started I started writing every time I would encounter some interesting case I would just go write about it and store it somewhere sometimes I would share with the newspapers some of them would get published on the newspaper others did not get published on the newspaper and that was the, sec- the second prompt other than the toastmaster assignment is that I really wanted to be able to contribute to the you know the storytelling in the space of healthcare and I wanted to be able to you know like Yusuf Daud used to have the surgeon's diary like I could periodically share an article that you know kind of the kind of mirrored that but it's not every day that you will get acceptance so the rejection rate is very high mm. so every time it was rejected I didn't really want that labor of love to just go to waste so I would curate it and put it as a blog 
And then over time, my wife told me, why don't you compile all this into a book? And that's when the thought of a book came through. And now I became a little more aggressive. Every day I went to work, I was like, what is that special queer thing about this patient I've seen that I can write? Not, not the usual presentation of the disease and we are done because that is already written for in the medical books. Mm. But what is that sociocultural interaction with surgery, with medical care, with, with this healthcare space that I can write about that will trick will intrigue people, will trigger people to do something. And that's how I started writing. And when you read one of the books, for instance, is a patient whose insurance pays for a certain surgery to remove a certain organ called the thyroid. And we all know once you remove that organ, then you have to give this patient some supplement for the rest of their life because there was something that organ was producing. It is no longer producing. And then the patient comes to me and tells me my insurance has refused for this. And I'm like, that is, that is illegal. They knew the moment they have said we are paying for that, there was going to be a consequence. And the consequence was going to be you are going to be on this lifelong medication, which is what we discussed with the patient during the consent. So for me, for that case, there was a case to argue. There was a case to argue that you can't just issue a blanket statement and say this medicine is not in the essential medicines that we sponsor. And therefore, you go and die with your problems. Because for me, that is my essential medicine. For another person in Kisumu, mm. the essential medicine might be anti-malaria. For another person in Kos, the essential medicine might be something else. So it was such stories that I curated and eventually I compiled them into a book. Mm. I'd hoped to make them 40, full 40 stories. I ended up with 20 because I also give myself a timeline. I need to, I need to be done with this project to start another one uh, because writing is like a startup. So I just needed to tick that box so that I could move to the next one. Yeah. So that's how I ended curating this and I have a few others that I don't know if I want to do another volume that uh, replicates this as part two again with other stories, but they keep coming day in, day out, they keep coming as, as, as we encounter them. So that in a nutshell is how the Chronicles of a Village Surgeon was born yeah. and actualized. Why village? Village because I schooled, I, I, went to the, I went to the village. The moment I finished my training, I trained in Aga Khan, I got a posting, or rather I got a job opening in Nyeri. And I started calling myself the village surgeon. It, it, it just sounded fancy as a tagline. So I would always post something on social media, is Facebook or YouTube, I mean, on, or Twitter at that time. I was, Instagram was not born. <laughs> when it was born, I wasn't on it. And I would always tag myself the village surgeon. So every time, if we walk right now into another medic, you, you will hear them tell, call me village surgeon so it, it, it took a life of its own it's like the tipping point okay. <laughs> it got to a tipping point and i couldn't control it and i decided then what i need to do is let let me use that and immortalize it in in, in the title of a book or something mm. like that yes yeah but but are there any different are the experiences in the village versus the experiences in an urban or t city different right? yes yes yeah. for sure they are they are on several fronts number one is access number two is affordability and number three is is the liberal health seeking behavior so let me speak to each of those access if i am in the village if we are here in buruburu it is a kilometer or two and we are in a hospital with a surgeon there's a certain village you will go and if someone falls sick now and they need to go to hospital they need to get onto a donkey to cross a certain river. They may need to be carried on the back of someone and then they get into a matatu. And if it is not a market day for that area, there are no matatus. So they have to wait for the next day. I have seen it real time. Like when I was in Meru, I used to document how many days did it take you to reach me as a surgeon? And you would sit and wonder at patients telling you, I got from my village I walked, I walked, I walked for hours to get to a bus stop on a day that is a marketplace so that I could get to the nearby shopping center, sleep there, then in the morning get the next matat which is coming now maybe to the county headquarters town and then from there I would come to the surgeon. So you can see the access to surgical services or the access to health or the access to a hospital in the rural village is not us in an urban center. This is number one. Number mm. two, we've spoken about affordability. Today, if someone around here is ill, probably they have a, a card. They will just go and say, this is my card. 
you write to the insurance, I want to be admitted or I want to have this procedure. Yeah. There, they will have to sell a cow. They will have to forgo the money for food. Some of them, especially the farthest nooks and crannies of the society. So that is the other issue. And the final issue, which also comes uh, out a bit in quite a number of uh, the stories, mm -hmm. is our intersection of our traditional African belief and the modern medicine. So people will be brought to the hospital because they have tried everything else, it has failed. Mm. Here, if someone is unwell, they won't start trying Mitishamba. Who even knows what Mitishamba is yeah. nowadays? Yeah. So they will quickly go to the hospital or they will go to Dr. Ngugu, unfortunately, <laughs> and say, Dr. Ngugu told me you should do this. Yes. Eh? So you see all those disparities. So when you say you're practicing in the village, you get the reality of the village, which is kind of a continent separate from what you see in Nairobi. Nairobi could pass for any Western capital in terms of access, in terms of affordability, in terms of acceptance. Yeah. In the rural Kenya, And expertise, it, just availability of... I don't even want to talk about expertise because that is the height of upper bid we have in the healthcare system. If you look at the 2022 Kenya Medical Practitioners and Dentist Council database, Nairobi County has four, over 4,000 doctors. Samburu County has two. How do you work like that? You can't work like that. So I didn't even want to come to that, but it's good you've brought it. So all those things just kind of tell you, if you learn in the village, there's so much you can give. There are so many who are so needy. There's so much impact you can give. That is why really I never minded being branded a village surgeon because I knew the village is where the real trouble is. Mm. The village is where the magnitude of diseases, affordability is a challenge, access is a challenge, distribution of the specialized Experts. Who, who decides not there. Who, which surgeon goes where? Brilliant question. Before, before it was easy. Because the human resources for health or the doctors were distributed from Afia House, Ministry of Health. <laughs> so, for instance, when I qualified, I got posted for internship. The moment I cleared my internship, which is one year where you work under supervision before you are licensed to practice as a doctor, after that, it was automatic posting by the government. And the moment they post you, the director of medical services then, Dr. Kimani, used to be very clever. He used to post the most people to the farthest flung areas because he knew probably you will resign and come back. But he knew if I said five, maybe three will resign and I will remain with two. If I said two, maybe all of them will resign. When we finished the batch we were in, 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 in internship, a colleague was posted to Maralal another one to Marsabit, I was posted to Kligoris, Transmara, and another colleague was uh, posted to Koibatek. There was, it didn't even make sense because we, we were in a, in, in, in a station in central province. Mm. So we thought we'd go within the central province, but we were sent like that. But sometimes you would complain and then realize, look, I am a national asset. I must serve every corner of the Kenya mm. because that area that doesn't have a doctor is not it's, 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 it's not by their doing. Maybe it's the socioeconomic capacity. Maybe it's the as access to education facilities. Maybe it's the financial capacity that has made them not have theirs. So if I don't go there, then who is going to go there? Then what happened? Mm -hmm. Two things happened. Number one, the ministry stopped automatic posting. So now you finish, you can get your internship, but the moment you have a, your license, you have to look for a job, like any other graduate. This was the first problem. The second problem, devolution. So when devolution came, what is controlled from the Ministry of Health is policy. is policy and technical support. Everything else, go to your county. And therefore, you see a county like Nairobi will have so many ingrown doctors. A county like Yambu, just because of their... I don't, know, I don't know if to call it GDP, just because of their income level and the, the capacity, they will have so many doctors. If you go to a marginalized community, maybe they have never produced a doctor. Mm -hmm. Maybe that county has never produced a doctor and they still have a million people who need a doctor in the ratio of one to a thousand. So if you are a million, you need maybe a thousand doctors there. But you've never produced a single doctor. Yeah. So which county is going to lend to you? So that's where the problem started. The moment we devolved healthcare, we forgot a universal 
you know, when we talk about universal, we forgot a universal health for the populations mm. and we segregated it. So you go to a county that is doing so well, you go to another county that is doing so poorly because the, the resources for health are not, they are not commensurate across. Yeah. So I think that's where the problem started. That's where the rain started beating us. Yeah. Yes. We have what? Two surgeons in every 10 and the, so 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 yeah yeah that that that, that ten was facility, ten level four hospitals. Yes. Yeah, so this was a this was a Ministry of Health sanctioned study back in 2018. I don't think if there's a new one. And they just wanted to look at level four. You see, level four is a district hospital. Yeah. A sub county. You Nowadays they are called sub county. Yeah. So from sub county going up, they just went looking at how many of these have a surgeon, and they just found two out of every ten are the ones with a surgeon, meaning the other eight must refer to the county hospital. But when you are referring to the county referral hospital, you shouldn't refer every Tom, Dick and Hardy for a lack of a better word, because there are small things that could be fixed lower down there, so that at the referral level you are dealing with the complex cases that must go there. Otherwise you choke the system. You choke the system so that every day you are dealing with road traffic accidents, broken limbs, burns, all these. And now the ones who are not in acute pain but still need the surgery do not get it because the space is not available. We are constantly firefighting to fix it. And the other stat uh, startling statistic is when you look at what we call the Lancet Commission, the Lancet Commission is a global commission that looks at how should we structure surgical resources. Now I'm not even looking at the doctors per se. The WHO ratio is one doctor to a thousand mm. population. But this one, the Lancet Commission now looks at the surgical workforce. And they are saying we don't just want to pick a surgeon because a surgeon cannot operate in isolation. Yeah. We want to pick a surgical provider who is a surgeon, an anesthetist, who is the person who puts the patient to sleep, and a gynecologist or an obstetrician who is someone who now deals with the surgery for expectant mothers. And out of these, these three cadres, we should have 20 per 100,000 population. So if in Kenya we have 50 million, you just need to say 50 million divided by 100,000 times 20 to see how many of these we should have. So when you look at the Kenyan statistics, we are what, 2, 2.3, 2.3 or they are about, so if you round it off because you don't have point something of a person, two people, to provide that per 100,000 population. That is net when you dilute it with the, with the population of doctors in Nairobi. If you go to a certain county, you might find it's zero. Now that is the reality. The other thing, I, I, I don't want to blame, you know, I don't want to blame uh, policy devolution and all that. The other, the other thing is we are a capitalist society. Mm. So therefore, as a doctor, I will go where my bread is buttered, isn't it? Yes, I have loved really practicing in the village, but at what professional disadvantage? At the professional disadvantage that I don't have the amenities, I don't have the latest equipment, yet I have invested heavily to train in knowing how to know to use the latest equipment. I don't have access to training opportunities if they come and they are just around Nairobi and you are in a far-flung area. All those things combined. So when you look at all of them, then it just becomes a huge space where there's a lot of discussion that needs to be done and there are a lot of things that we need to fix it. But one of them that I've constantly said and I've written about this in both peer-reviewed publications and in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the newspapers is a lot of us, I being among them, strongly observe that the doctors, the nurses, the clinic officers, essentially the, the healthcare providers should be managed from the nat national level. That is the only way you will come down and say we have 47 counties and we have 47,000 doctors or we have 4,700 doctors. So every county, take your 100 doctors. Or that's the only way you will distribute by population. Otherwise, it just depends. One county might decide we are not interested in hiring doctors. They are too opinionated for us or they have this or we don't have a political mileage by just going to the podium and saying we employed 10 doctors let's just do what let's construct so you will find a hospital with a big building but who is supposed to come there if the human resource is not there so those those are the discussions that we usually have in those robust fora when we are needed and we are hoping something will 
you know, something will give. Yeah. Yes. When we had the coalition government of Kibaki and Raila, we had two ministers for health. We have Beth Mugwe and Professor Anyang Nyongo, who are minister for health, medical services, medical services and, public health. and public health. What is the difference? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Mike. That's, that's, that's a technical question, but I would like to answer it this way. Under health, under health, you have what are called preventive services, promotive services, and then curative services. And therefore, if you want to have that ministry being so big, have two huge directorates under that, then you can say this directorate de deals with how we prevent disease. Mm -hmm. So how we deal with sanitation, how we deal with vaccination, how we do all these campaigns about, you know, the curfews and all that, mm -hmm. rapid response in case we have outbreaks, all that, that is called public health. Not individual health, mm -hmm. public health. We have gone to a podium, there are 100 people, we are teaching them hand hygiene mm -hmm. so that you don't catch a diarrheal disease. We are teaching them isolation so that you don't contaminate or contract disease that is coming from another person. Yeah. We are talking about curfew, so that disease that has an outbreak in this locality does not spread out. This, this is a well-established discipline called public health. Now, when we come to individualized care, mm. now you are sick. I need to give you this medicine. I need to give you this injection. I need you admitted in this. Then we make it medical services. So that is how both they are twins. You cannot separate public health from medical services. So even if you walk into a hospital, there will be a public health nurse who deals with this, who looks out. There will be a public health expert who looks at how, how, how is the sanitation in this hospital? How are we prevented from the outbreak of diseases? How are we making sure that we have this and this and these measures? Then there will be another person who is conducting. How are we treating once? people have contracted the disease. So one is like prevent the population from getting the disease. The other is like let's treat the disease now that the people have gotten the disease. But even at the moment, you know, after the 2010 constitution, then the, the arrangement of the ministries was more or less kind of aligned and dictated in the constitution in that uh, relevant schedule. So even now, if you go to the Ministry of Health, there will be the Directorate of Public Health and there will be Principal Secretary for that. Mm -hmm. And there's a Principal Secretary, uh, state, state Department for Medical Services. So they might align here and there, but more or less they, they will always exist together because you will prevent, but even if you prevent, one or two will contract the disease. Mm -hmm. Therefore, another person must come to cure. Mm -hmm. And this person can cure, but they will break their back if you are not preventing. Or if once we release the patients to go home, they still need that rehabilitation and all that. So that's how public health and medical services come together. So the other times they will be split as a ministry, other times they are brought together. So they, they just keep, you know, if you go back in history, you will find when they were together as one ministry, they split into two, back together as one, split into two. At the moment is one, but you will find the two directorates there. Yeah. Yes. So back to the book. I have a copy. Get yours. Where can we get the copy of the Nuria. book? Nuria. Just go on Nuria, yes. cl uh, click Chronicles of a Village Surgeon, you will find it, they will deliver to your doorstep. It's just yeah. 1,500 shillings. Yeah, And we have a very good partnership with Nuria Bookstore, who are custodians of a majority of Kenyan literature works. And this is one of them. Check out their platform. They have a very nice and easy platform where you can go, place your order, and purchase. But they also have a physical space where you can walk in, sift through the, 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 the shelves and pick the book that you want there on uh, the Baza, that building, the Baza Plaza on the 11th floor. Check them out and you'll see amazing, amazing, amazing works. But Dr. looking at this book, you, I, I, like, I, like, I like how you've, you've creatively worked the, the, the headings. But there are, there are a few that, are, that, that caught my attention that I would really want you to, to talk to us quickly about chapter one, the very first one, when the pot belly bullied the bullet. What happened? We, we speak very ill of people with one pack. <laughs> one complete pack. One complete pack. <laughs> yeah, this was, a, this was some times back and, uh, you know, gun violence, people shot in the abdomen. The moment you're on duty and you're told we have someone with a gun shot to the abdomen, you completely freak out on their behalf because you, know, you don't know where the bullet will go. And therefore, this was one such case I was called to review 
gentleman who has been shot, uh, some streets of Nairobi, and had been brought to the training site I was in then. And I examined him, very fat-bellied gentleman, very, very, very fat-bellied, a lot of belly fat. Mm. And, you know, he, he wasn't in extremely critical condition, and therefore we told him, you know what, ordinarily we would probably rush from the emergency room to the theater, but for you, let's go through the CT scanner to find out where the bullet has gone. Because the other thing about bullets is once they hit the body, they don't, they don't travel a predictable path. It can ricochet, it can hit a bone and take a corner or something like mm. that. So you can never say because the entry is here and the exit is here, there's a straight line connecting the two. It can take angles and turns, it can split into parts. In that split that. second, yes. it is able to do all that. Yes, because when you look at those guys who look at ballistics and forensics, the bullet does not actually, you know, go straight. Sometimes yes. it goes, you know, rotating yes. like that eh? and all that. So anyway, the long story is we take the patient for the CT scanner and then we are surprised that the bullet has not gotten into the belly. It has just gone under the skin and traveled because the layer of fat is this big. Mm. It has traveled in the layer of fat and come out. So we decide, you know, for you, we are not going to do proper what we call laparotomy, like open the entire belly. We can just clean up this blood trap. And you'll be okay. And then my colleagues now, when we meet in the morning, make mockery of me because I, I have always been slim. I think I was even slim at that time. <laughs> and then they, 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 they tell me, boss, if it was you, this bullet, it would have hit, it would have gotten to your spinal cord. The bullet would have hit probably a very What, what effect did the fat have on, on, on whatever bullet was doing in the, in the body? Usually what happens is the belly is, you know, covered by layer upon layer of several other tissues. Eh? So mm. the inner one is a nice lining that contains everything. Then next you have the muscles. Those are the six pack. On top of the muscles, you have fat. Mm. Now it is this fat that can increase or reduce based on how toned a person is or now they have observed their diet, uh, including if they have any genetic predisposition to obesity and all that. So that space, that space because the bullet was not going directly, it was going at a tangent afforded the person this space for the bullet still to be able to travel between the skin under the fat without getting inside inside the critical organs and still come out like on a tangent come from here and come out that without having to get critical organs mm -hmm. that may not have happened if someone was so slim because then it would just traverse a space of like an inch but here is someone with 10 inches of fat you see so it gets space to traverse without coming to hit your intestines or mm -hmm. your stomach or your big blood vessels that can then risk your life. Hail the emperor of all mal maladies. Yes. Tell us about this one. There is there's a book by I hope I will be able to pronounce him properly. Siddharth Mukherjee. Siddharth Mukherjee is, 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 is a writer, he's an oncologist. Oncologist is a specialist in cancer in the, U, in the US. And he has written a book titled, it's a Pulitzer uh, Prize winner called The Emperor of Maladies. And he just gives a chronological evolution of cancer as a disease. Mm -hmm. And when I look at cancer, especially as a general surgeon, there are two or so cancers that are really horrible, and one of them is cancer of the stomach, and the other one is cancer of the pancreas. Because by the time they, they show up, they have probably moved very fast, such that you can't cure them. Or when they creep on you, the moment you catch them, they're just so aggressive by nature. And this was a case of a gentleman who unfortunately had been seen time and time and time again, and he was told, ah, you, you have gastritis, you have uh, acidity, you have H. pylori bacteria. And then eventually when he landed in our care, and we examined him and sent him for a, a special scan we call endoscopy, then we found all this time, all this time, what was healing him was cancer of the stomach. But at that moment, it was difficult to dislodge it because it was already embedded and spread beyond where you can remove with a, a surgical blade. And the problem with it is that you can't remove it because it's spread, but then it kind of blocks the only area that we know that you can use to feed, you know. So once it takes up the space in the stomach, even if you eat, you are not able to digest, you're not able to absorb, to absorb. So people really kind of waste away. And, 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 and then 
the type that is often there which is fairly aggressive will not even respond extensively to medications that we call chemotherapy. So this is one case we, you know, I just discussed to highlight how serious a problem it is and say if for me I was to pick from now the book of Mukaji, the emperor of maladies, I would say the, the, the main queen in that empire is actually the cancer of the stomach because quite a number of cancers are fairly forgiving cancer of the thyroid you pick it early if it comes of the breast is a little on the surface again it's possible to pick it early and remove it and you know kind of almost guarantee cure but cancer of the stomach is 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 is, is a nightmare for us as surgeons that was essentially the message in that story mm. Mm. there are very many instances for example in our system today where you go to most of these clinics especially we spoke about um a medical facility let me just call it facility because today we also have dispensing chemists and things like that some of them are just run by clinical officers not to degrade them but the truth is there is a level of expertise that they still don't have to diagnose certain conditions they misdiagnose someone and there are consequences of that misdiagnosis what are the rights that these patients have thank you thank you yeah. thank you uh, First and foremost, maybe in retrospect, we always say in retrospect, you are always right. But if you put at the beginning, you could still have lots of areas to error in. The first thing about this case is, one, I cannot guarantee for sure scientifically, because I'm a scientist, that at that point when they presented with symptoms that sounded like gastritis, that they had cancer. There is no evidence available to prove that. You can just infer and assume. Could it have been? But there's a likelihood it wasn't because we know gastritis over time, very long time, especially certain type of, type of gastritis can also lead to cancer. This is number one. Number two, and then I'm coming to the patient rights. Number two is that granted the person was not coming back to the same person over and over and over. So they would come, next day they're in another chemist, next day they're somewhere else, Yet all these are the low tire levels where they are, maybe they're meeting the clinical officer. Sometimes it's even maybe a pharmacy practitioner in a chemist and they just go come with a prescription and say, I always use this mm. and I'm still suffering. And then you get a refill. But the point you raise is very pertinent. Number one is the population of specialists because you cannot chastise that person. They just perceived the much they could. Until you think second, and that happens to everyone, specialists alike. I will see a patient, I will say there are nine possible problems here. I will go with problem number one and number two. You get another specialist, they bring in another specialist of the same qualification. They bring in another angle and say, wait, what have you thought about this? Have you thought about this? So, you know, I'm not able to critique that back end because I didn't know exactly the expertise. Mm. But if the expertise is low, the much that we can do is, you know, there used to be this famous statement, Maumivi Akizidi Mone Daktari, you know, mm. if, if you've been given medication and you're not feeling better, then you need to go to a higher level in terms of specialization mm. or seek a second opinion. And when you look at the ministry's uh, patient's rights charter document, it talks about patient's rights, it talks about patient responsibilities. Now, one of those listed rights, and I talk about that in one of my videos on YouTube, is the right to a second opinion. The right to a second opinion is a patient right. It's enshrined in the patient rights charter. Everyone understands that. No one can deny you that. And the second opinion can be, you are coming from a professor, coming to another even junior colleague who you think you sync with, mm. you think you vibe with, you think the energies are correlating. So the patient has a responsibility to seek a second opinion, which is their right if they are not getting better. Now, was it negligence on this side? I don't know because, you know, the thing is now you have to establish the expertise of this person and say, based on what you have, you have failed to see an obvious thing. So th th that becomes now a case-by-case -case basis. But for sure, there are so many people who will present with a problem and it's not picked by the first person because then you don't go back to that first person for them to get that feedback loop and say, oh, I thought you have this. Yeah. I investigated like this. I give you this medication. You have not improved. So I'm going to number two. That is also very useful to the doctor because they... 
we are dealing, we understand a very small proportion of the biology of the human body. The human body is a very complex system, but we just have to find a simplistic way of understanding it. So the moment we accept that there could be a lot that I don't know about this person, but let me first say, based on what you've given me and the investigations you've done, these are the top three. You go and you come back and things are worsening, then I will tell you, I think let's look for number four and five. And one of the things I might say is, let me call a colleague to also give a second opinion. So I sometimes if the system is not well structured and that doesn't happen, for several reasons, one is you might go into a public facility for all with all the respect to our public facilities. And today you meet one person, tomorrow is another. There is not a likelihood that you meet the same person for three or four clinic visits, mm. which then means the only thing that will be available is there is a medical record that has been kept that people are referring to. And sometimes the lower facilities might not have that capacity. Yeah. You sometimes find people going with a book. Everything it's, is written on the book, yeah. they carry it home. Yeah. Next time they come, they don't have it. So every the, the whole the chain the whole there. chain is lost yeah. you know so it, it's bigger than just the patient right but the patient has the right to a second opinion that yeah. is their right absolutely Actually I want to talk about I'm um, I'm interested in so many titles on your shelf yes. but I'm so impressed guys this book is 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 nice the stories will help you reflect upon very many things but what has been your experience in a medical facility what what are some of the things that we are talking about here that raises a lot of questions in your head or, or maybe with your friends and family. Feel free, comment, reach out. Daktari is within reach. We can always get back and, and ask him some of the pertinent questions you're asking. Some of the things you've alluded to, the facilities, the equipment. Because sometimes I ask myself, some of you guys train abroad. You go and get your master's in the US. The facilities work well. How do you ad adjust when you come back home? Some of you train in Aga Khan, in Nairobi Hospital, and some of the facilities in the city that are well-equipped. But then you're posted in a village uh, hospital or dispensary down there. Do you ever sometimes feel like there is a waste of your talent? It's an extreme sport. <laughs> <laughs> it's an extreme sport. Yeah. You, you, you feel like that, but the beauty is... The beauty is that you get also instant satisfaction when you see this client, for all intended and purposes, cannot reach Nairobi. They cannot afford the private facilities in Nairobi. And because of the expertise I have, I have given them what they would have gotten in a very premier private facility. Mm. So that kind of gives you that satisfaction, you know, that job satisfaction. The other bit is over time, over time, you know, there is this reverse referral. If you have the technique mm. and the expertise, it is easy to know who will bring which gadgets. And that arrangement can be done so that people just need to drive from Nairobi to Nyeri with the gadgets you do and they come back to Nairobi. Mm. And instead of the patient coming, it's better you go to the patient. Mm. So I feel that is before I left, for instance, Meru, this is what I had started, you know, engineering so that there's no need for someone to come to Nairobi when the equipment vendor can come with the equipment there. We do it, surgeon is happy, patient is happy, the vendor has gotten his commission, they come back. That's a model that, you know, I think will plug the space. The ideal, the ideal would be for every public hospital to be equipped to that level. But, you know, we live in a world of infinite needs with very finite resources. Mm. So it's always a delicate balancing act. I cannot go and stand to the cabinet secretary or the president and tell them, buy this having gadget for surgery yeah. when there are people dying of hunger. Like now you kind of have to balance the whole thing. So we also understand the dire need that is there. Just the other day I was discussing with my colleague who is in NHS in the UK and everyone looks at NHS like the gold standard, but there their waiting time is three years. Like you have a condition that is not causing you pain right now, you need what we call planned or elective surgery, you will be booked 2027, 2026. Not 2025, 2027, 2026. Because the resources also are not yet sufficient to cover the entire population. Remember this podcast, What's on Your Shelf, is brought to you courtesy of the Kenya National Library Service. And uh, now we're in partnership with Nuria Bookstore where you will find this book and many other titles. They are both online and also they have a physical space at the 11th floor of 
the Bazaar Plaza. Check them out, see what you can get. But also, this is also brought to you as your Black Boy Media, who are the production partners of this podcast, who give us very crisp, clean uh, uh, sound and picture for you to keep enjoying. But feel free to subscribe to the channel, S- send a comment, share this with your friends, because you liking, you subscribing to the channel gives us the opportunity to have even better conversations with each and every click of the button. So we also have to see what other things is Dektari Ariaru reading. And and uh, as you've mentioned, complications. And I transitioned to it by Atul, Atul Gawande. Gawande. Tell us about complications. What yes. is he talking about? Yeah. So in a nutshell, Atul Gawande, who is a general surgeon, general and endocrine surgeon and a professor in Harvard, speaks about the the fallibility of assuming that we 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 know everything about the human body, assuming that medicine as we practice it is a perfect science because sometimes we do everything right by the book, but patients still die. And, 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 and therefore he shares some of these experiences and calls upon us to every so often do what we call a mobility and mortality audit. That is where you sit back and review a case where you've lost a patient or a patient has under complication and you ask yourself, so what went wrong? How can we improve it? Not to beat up individuals who are involved, but to find system faults that you can improve on. And mobility and mortality audits have become the hallmark of inequality improvement endeavors within the hospital setup because that is the only system that we have where you can come and say, I feel here if I had done this, the outcome would have been different. But just that debriefing kind of helps the teams. So Complications is a book written a little about surgical patients, surgical complications, but it's written again in easy flowing language. If you can lay your hands on it and read it, mm. you will enjoy some brilliant storyteller. That is just one of his four other books. Mm. Of his four books in total, they are very, very, very nice books. Yeah. What is that one thing you can say you now individually? Forget about the space with all your professional colleagues. You as an individual can say, took from this book. From this book, I took uh, accepting what you can't change, you know, because that is the essence that this is how things are. Stop beating yourself and saying, I'm the one who failed. Sometimes it just went that way because if you replaced yourself with another person, with all the other circumstances being the same, probably the outcome would still be the same. Mm. So I think it's just a call for us to extend ourselves some grace Mm. once in a while. Dr. when people talk about surgeons, you know, things are getting thick and serious. There is that rumor that most of these persons who've been killed over the last couple of weeks, some of them, because they were found to be... Mutilated. Their bodies were mutilated, and some parts of the body looks like some parts were missing. From a surgical perspective, how possible is it that somebody can kidnap somebody, operate on them, make away with their organs, go into a certain market somewhere, sell it, be given that money? Thank you, Mike. That is a very heavy topic that I know we've brought severally, and it's one of the things I mentioned in my book. One of the stories is a patient who travels to an Asian country for kidney transplant, but they come back, they don't have the kidney, and the donor who accompanied them has a scar and their kidney is missing. And you already know that kidney has been trafficked. So organ trafficking is a very lucrative black market trade, but it can only thrive where there is, you know, there are crooked colleagues who are, because for you to transplant that organ, there are a lot of things that need to happen. So theoretically, yes, in the Kenyan context, probably not, because if I want to walk you through a kidney transplant, for instance, if Mike wants to to donate his kidney to Stanley, Mike will go through a series of tests that confirm that his makeup and Stanley's makeup are so similar that Stanley will not reject Mike's kidney. This is the first level of assessment. Mm. Either you have a twin brother, because that is obvious, everything is almost the same, or you have a close relative and then we have to check a lot of things, draw your blood, a lot of specialized tests. Then the day we are doing the surgery, both the the donor and the recipient or the person who is going to receive the donated organ 
have to be in adjoining theaters. Two teams are operating. So that we are set, we say clock, start. We start and then we tell you we are 80% complete, start on the other side. And then once the organ has been detached or removed from the feeding blood vessel, because it has constantly received blood for it to be alive, mm -hmm. it has to be transported in a cooler box for a certain period of time beyond which it will no longer be viable. And therefore, for that technicality to be organized so that you have it within an hour or two, within this period of time, the network needs to be so intricately planned. And I will invite listeners to watch, even just Google on the YouTube, you know, black market kidney, you will find some documentaries that have been shown up around Southeast, around, around Asian, some Asian areas where there are those rackets. There are those rackets. The person has been kidnapped. The organ has been harvested. But the people doing this sometimes get, you know, they don't even know they are doing it. They think, I'm doing the operation because I'm harvesting the organ to be taken for delivery to the other person. But there is a way people forge papers and all that. Let me come to the Kenyan context. I feel it's not possible. I feel it's not possible. The expertise you need, unless someone who is who is trained in surgery, who knows how exactly to identify where am I going to cut this blood vessel, where am I going to cut this other tissue that is connecting, so that what I have removed can still be attached properly without danger in the next person. That, I find it nearly impossible, so to speak, unless there are surgeons who sneak without our knowledge, <laughs> you know, and come to do this. So I don't feel, in the Kenyan context, that... There is organ trafficking going on, but those are personal feelings. What I feel could be happening, which we have sometimes felt, is, you know, the black magic market also. Mm. That says, oh, if you come with oh, this witchcraft. size. Yeah, witchcraft. Yeah. If you come with this size of a liver and this size of a kidney, you'll become a millionaire. You know, nonsense like that. Yeah. And there are people who will fall for that. And that can happen. And I remember that conversation came with the rise of the Shakahola cult and all those things. And mm. I remember talking about it on uh, NTV and again, making the same comment, I don't think it is possible to just easily come harvest organs and sh ship them out because those organs need to have a small period of time within which you have to reattach them to the person who is to receive them. And before you do that, you must have done that investigation on this person and the person to receive them just so you know if they are compatible. Mm -hmm. Unless you're just shipping them, buying, selling, and then the other person are told, okay, you have a good kidney, it will be okay. They buy or they pay a lot of money and then they go and they reject it. So within a few months again, they are sick because the kidney has failed. So I feel like maybe the black magic witchcraft bit could be playing a role but the second bit is I feel that there could be a criminal enterprise that has found this sensational way so that they know if I go murder someone and live like that, people will have a lot of questions. But if I have a diversionary tactic where I mutilate the body and scoop some organ, people will now start chasing another ducking squirrel and leave the antelope, you know. Mm. Yeah, I, I don't think they're connected. These are my personal feelings. I don't feel they're connected. And knowing the Kenyan ecosystem, I don't think we have an explosion of surgeons who are so jobless and they're hiding in the bushes and the apartments mm. just to get into the black market of organ trafficking. But it's something that's happening in some other countries elsewhere. Okay. Yes. So so I've, I've, there's a book I've seen here that uh, is written by one of uh, the guest I've had on this podcast, mm. uh, Wanjiru Kaburu. And what was interesting for me, the first time I was meeting the name Stanley Aruyaru was on this book. Because when I, when I was hosting her for the podcast, I saw you did her forward. T tell, tell me about the process of your participation in The Power of Self-Love. The Power of Self-Love was uh, a genuine attempt by Wanjiru Kaburu to just call upon us to just pause for a second and love ourselves. You know, 
and 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 commit to ourselves know ourselves love ourselves and all that and i had interacted with kaburu for quite some time when i was in nyeri through the toastmasters organization because she was the club president and then she took some other positions i was also a club officer there and we got talking and she told me i'm writing a book i don't know who is going to write for me a forward and just casually uh, joking like oh you know i can i can write for you the forward i didn't know the the content of the book and then she told me i am done with the book and i feel i have covered whatever i needed to cover here is the manuscript can you write a forward and suddenly i felt like saying i was joking <laughs> 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 because suddenly now the weight was on my shoulders yeah. and i read that it was very moving it and parts that were really showing the vulnerable parts of the other yeah. and going back to the challenges at home with our society all that and 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 i just jotted out what i felt that book represented so i i i like to highlight it in my shelf because it is the first published book with an isbn number that i have been asked to write a forward to mm. and it was a great honor and privilege to do that how you close your 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 forward is very powerful this book brings to you a clear message it tells you that the world should not happen to you you should happen to the world break it down yeah absolutely because what wanjiro shares in that book is the the, the trouble she has gone through at some point to the deepest levels of despair to the point of attempting suicide uh, spoiler alert for those who have not read it and sometimes at that point it is easy to take to alcohol to take to drugs and say i am a wreckage when you hear sometimes what her family members remarks are when you hear sometimes what her principles remarks are yeah. when you hear sometimes the kind of hostilities she goes through mm. but the fact that she can rise up and say you know what that is nothing i am still here essentially crystallizes that you know what you don't come to the world like uh, you know like 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 a flag and follow the direction of the wind you can also say yeah you 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 do me a first one i rise up i fall i rise up and i think for me that was the message the message that yes the world is going to be brutal to you but you can also rise up and tell it you give me this and this is what i've made out of it mm. this was for me the understanding from wanjiro's work wow and i hope it's the same understanding those who read it will come up with i read the book is it's a very quick read mm. and i think what one of the key things that i acknowledged is that she put her life bare for people to learn from but also her journey back and even i've also read her second book where she is also it looks like this gave her very good thoughts to build on the second one which she talks about the power that comes from within and i think spiritually or not one of the most important things is the journey of self discovery where you're able to discover who you really are and what are the fundamentals that make you you and once that is clearly gotten it's it's very 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 critical for you to now find the things that help you push forward and by the way just to tell you that this book also the power of self love is also available on nuria check out nuria.com you'll find this one in dr stanley ariaru's book the chronicles of a village surgeon doc i want to pick randomly some of the books that are here and and maybe we can quickly 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 talk about them and this one i want to try and run away from surgery as much as possible so long walk to freedom long walk to freedom brilliant book by nelson mandela this is this this is the icon of giving oneself for me it's not the book it is it is the epitome of sacrificing yourself to spend a quarter of a century 27 years to be precise in prison because of something you hold true to today if someone was asked to be in prison for two or three days because of something they hold to they might easily pick the microphone and say i was misquoted just so that they can abandon that so i loved this and when i read this book which was how long almost 20 years back it was a nice trip down memory lane in history because i remember the history of the apartheid movement the mm. anc formation the 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 mkoto wa the 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 spear of the nation which was the military wing of the, 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 the that party but 
what stood for me much as he spoke about the entire apartheid and how it was building mm-hmm. are two things one is how he gave himself for 25 27 years to people he didn't know to people who hated him and when he came out he didn't seek revenge yeah. he didn't seek revenge he didn't call for you know the whites the boers or the dutch to be you know chased out of south africa he just said this is the rainbow nation i feel south africa south africans might have a contrary opinion to this but i feel that leapfrogged south africa to the top of africa they were among the last to gain independence actually yeah. i think the last 19 yes, late 19, na- early 90s yeah. but they are more or less ahead of us i feel because of that because if he now went on a witch hunt and settling scores mm. probably would have triggered a genocide or civil war that would again you know plummet the country to the depth that were even worse off than what happened they didn't take them so for that we have to give the man his flowers that is what i take from the long walk to freedom yeah i i love the book honestly i think i i found it a bit slow what i loved about it is that the historical part the part that impressed me the most that i think i say I held dearly is the very very first parts of the book where he's talking about his childhood talking about how he left his village after his father's death going to the city and just that transition from a life where you have almost nothing and any okay because that is the world you know to a place where there's so much mm. and two totally different worlds mm. you almost became a mechanic almost yes almost tell us about that sika you still doing almost a similar thing yes task, yes but now on a different yeah yes. a- absolutely sika 1998 yeah. i sit my kcp exam this time the results used to take quite some time not like nowadays they are out before christmas Imagine. <laughs> so the results finally came out i think to once early january and then you you had to wait to receive the admission letter mm. my admission letter came to a local provincial secondary school that time and when my dad went to pick it the teachers asked him so where are you taking this bright boy because i had scored very well the score i got there stood for 16 or so years before uh, another people could break that record and he told them i don't have money because you know i come from a really humble background i am the only of my siblings who's gotten to university with a degree and uh, my parents were illiterate for lack of a better word to use they didn't have formal education so we were struggling in terms of enlightenment enlightenment in terms of education but also in terms of financial ability mm. and therefore my dad was here cutting his coat according to his cloth mm. the size not withstanding yeah. and therefore he told them i am taking my son to the village polytechnic not the norm, not the current tvet where you get a diploma mm. to the village polytechnic where you would graduate as an artist yes the skill part of this yes so i was supposed to go there and learn how to become a, a mechanic and a driver and i remember he went ahead he wanted to make his dread true so we did some shopping i carried my metallic box i even traveled the night before the reporting day to a nearby shopping center where i slept so over. wait a minute the, the the village polytechnic was a boarding yes it was ah, okay. yes it was yes it has a boarding wing So I traveled I was to, to to you know to just walk now to the village polytechnic to report the next Monday and then that Sunday the teachers from my primary school got wind of this <coughs> and they had to send someone to stop me and tell me don't report because there's something the teachers are planning so the teachers and the parents came together they conducted a harambe and that is how I now was saved from reporting to become a car mechanic and driver to join secondary school so i joined secondary school on a monday when the rest of the students were coming back from midterm and then that is probably the journey to becoming the human mechanic i am today started such ones would not like to hear this i like now to liken my current practice to yeah. being a mechanic only that i repair engines when they are running as a car mechanic you switch off the engine yes. as a surgeon you operate when the, the engine, engine is still running run. yes that, that, that's, that's, that, that's, that's, that's yes that is the short and long of it the yeah. next one this is one of the people i i listen to his podcast the most ah, jay shetty jay shetty think like a monk yes tell us about think like a monk i think like a monk the one thing i keep <clears throat> I, i i hold it in high regard is because it has formed my mind on how my next book is going to be 
the, the second book I'm writing because it's more like trying to see if 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 surgery is mystery, how can I demystify that mystery to the lay person? But secondly, if surgery is mystery, then it means when you come here, you might meet a few idiosyncrasies and a few rituals that then you might carry in your day-to-day -day life outside of surgery and they still work for you. For instance, the idiosyncrasy of neatness. Surgeons are idiosyncratically just want to be neat. You don't want, you know, give a lot of clutter around, etc., etc. And if you just start looking at surgeons, you might just quickly resonate with this. I love uh, Jay Shetty's Think Like a Monk because he, he brings us back to the granular life. One of the experiences he speaks about is where they are told every day, walk the same road, but find something new. You can imagine coming up the stairs to this studio every single day and you are tasked to find something new. It might be a fly on the wall that you did not leave in the morning. It might be some leaf that has fallen by the wayside, but just observe something new. And that is kind of forcing us to reconnect with nature, especially in the hyper-fast world that we are in, that you're moving from job to job, from assignment to assignment, from this task to this task. You don't slow down. You don't understand yourself. So I love that he just starts slowly when he goes and meets those very young people in the monastery and asks them, what was the last lesson? What was the first lesson you were taught? And they, were, they tell him, we are taught how to breathe. And suddenly you're like, okay, these are things you take for granted, but if you stop breathing, you stop living. So if you could harness your breathing pattern, I, I wouldn't say I'm an expert in meditation of breathing, mm -hmm. but I found that so exciting. And, 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 and that, that really was, you know, you can just step back, learn something and come, come back to your field with that additional spicing. So he went out of a secular world where he was a graduate, went into a monk where he owned only two robes. You wash one, you wear the other. He slept on mats and they shared a common bathroom. And after three years, he came back and he learned a lot through that experience that makes him better on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think that connects to David Epstein's range, which, which sometimes you just want to be top of your niche. You want to specialize. You want to specialize again mm -hmm. just so that you are the only one. But, you know, when, uh, what, what, what David speaks about on, on, in this book range, which I'm just reading, I haven't gotten even midway, is that however specialized you are, the more broad knowledge base you have, the better a specialist you become. And this has, spoken, uh, this has been spoken about heavily. For instance, if you went to a training site for the long distance marathoners, they might not just be running. You might find them in the swimming pool. But they're not swimming because they want to compete in swimming. But by swimming, they gain an extra technique in maybe breath holding, in maybe exercising certain moves of the arms. And they know all these experiences culminate in making you a better, you know, expert. And that partly makes me continue what I do because I am a surgeon, but I find myself in health management. I find myself in administration. I find myself in policy. I find myself writing, you know, speaking. All these, I believe, the more I excel in this, the more I become a better surgeon, as opposed to if I just became that aloof, lone surgeon who just operates. So I know everything about operating, but then I am blindsided on this other. I am not that 360 degree person. So I think Jay Shetty brings that to fruition, and that is the same conversation that David Epstein has in, in his book range. When, when you think about it practically, people talk about uh, uh, you become a uh, uh, how do they say it? You are jack of all a trades. jack of all trade and a master of none. Yeah. Isn't it criticized that that I don't know if I want to call it a theory or a methodology or an approach to life? Don't you feel like it's the same thing that is criticized as being a jack of all trades? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And everything is just a balance. You know, they talk about yin and yang. There is never black and white in life. That's what I believe in. It's just that gray area in the middle. When you read uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, the one thing I carried away from that Rich Dad, Poor Dad, he said, if you want to have a good career in employment, you have to specialize and belong to a trade union. These were the two things he said. Mm -hmm. And then Outliers, brilliant book. And, and this is, he, he, once he spoke, once Malcolm Gladwell spoke about the 10,000 hour mm -hmm. 
that makes a specialist, everyone went there and they said, for you to become a specialist, you must practice for 10,000 hours. So if you are a surgeon, you must operate a certain number of, of operations for you to become proficient. Musician, play for this number. A fly, a pilot, clock this number of flight minutes, etc., etc. But you see, people are coming back and saying, yes, you have gotten that, then what? That is not enough. Mm. That is not enough because if I know how to operate so well, but I don't know how to communicate well with my assistant, mm. then my assistants will undo the good I have done. Sure. You see? But if I understand how to communicate with my assistants, then it becomes a team effort. They enhance. They enhance that. So one plus one becomes three, not two, because everyone is synergizing and working together. And 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 I think that 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 cannot be overestimated. So the the speak of you know ten thousand hour rule and all that is just not it's just not the final bit. Yes, you've become a specialist, but what will move you from being a podium finisher to a gold medal winner, mm. from a gold medal winner to a world record breaker? These are those five. You know, now sweating the little the little stuff. You know. Mm. Sweating the little stuff just because you speak better than me, you become a better surgeon because all of us are 10,000 hours, all of us are there. So, what is the differentiator? Could be your interpersonal skills, and that is where a lot of you know the conversation is moving now, even in leadership. Uh, what, what is your emotional intelligence? What is your social intelligence like? Because the rest is, is, is no longer military, yes, you are the top person, but it's not all industries render themselves to command and control where we shout and you go like this. Mm. Others now require you to make your team feel comfortable enough, free enough to innovate, to challenge ideas, to bring their A game, to, to, to want to contribute, not to want to sabotage. So there's a certain level where now you're going the extra mile of performance and becoming an outlier to borrow uh, Malcolm Gladwell's uh, title by just harnessing a few other things, a few other things that the rest have not done. So it doesn't water down specialization. It just is on top. Otherwise, you'll end up with 100 specialists. So who is number one out of those 100? Mm. And I feel that is where now that, that, that tape is pushed a little. But when you're looking at those three books, plus the outliers, how do you think those three have influenced you as a parent? When I read Outliers, I read it after I had finished internship. I, it was in one day as I was, you know, in Amatatu from OTC to Kligoris mm. through Narok. And I, I, I wished, I wished I had read it when I was in high school. Because it wakes you up and gives you a perspective. Like when they speak about deliberate practice, those hours of clocking in, then you know for sure that... If you have to clock this number of hours, you know what that means? That means work ethic, that means consistency, that means discipline, all those things combined. So sometimes as a parent, I might want to talk a lot to you know my daughter and tell them, do this, do this, do this, do this. But if they read that and saw the way it is packaged, then suddenly they understand, oh, this is why I'm told to do this over and over and over so that I get better. So that is to speak to outliers, for instance, and the 1,000 hour rule. In terms of, uh, you know, the monk, is for me to say there will be always something additional to the mainstream education. There will be always something additional. For instance, go do your degree, but what else can you dig deep inside and bring as something authentic to Mike or to Stanley? If, if you parade all the surgeons of Kenya, all of us have our own have got our own identities. And I, I don't think everyone needs to go to the monastery to become a monk for three years to come back to copy Shetty. But someone can say, during this time of, I want to cultivate these other strong points that I have. Because what that does is it gives you other avenues to experience your work and to experience your life. I am a surgeon. The day I am frustrated, and I, I want to quit surgery because all patients are complicating. I have lost a patient on the table. Things are not just working right. And I've been in theater all night and you hate my life the way it is at the moment. I can retreat and maybe write. 
I can retreat, maybe write a blog. If I have another skill, I can fall back to. So they become cushions so that, yes, you have your strong point, but you have other cushions that then help you to have a balanced life in terms of, you know, the will of life or the sphere of life, so to speak. I think in, a, in summary, that more or less would be what I pick from, especially from uh, Jay Shetty's Think Like a Monk. Yes. Doc, at some point when you were speaking, you spoke about trauma. And I think trauma that you spoke about is different from the trauma I was thinking about. What is trauma? Trauma is injury, to put plainly. And, and then if you want to break it down, in surgeries, in surgery, we will deal with physical trauma. Someone is cut, someone is stabbed, someone is shot, someone's leg is broken, someone has been hit by a car, etc., etc. Other people might talk about mental trauma, that they have been injured mentally. They have been caused mental anguish and, 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 you know, and harassed and abused and, you know, insulted, all that. So when you, when you just put it as trauma, then there could be several connotations. If you're talking about childhood trauma, it may be a little more mental than physical. But in the space of surgery, when you talk about trauma, trauma in the space of surgery is a sub-discipline that just deals with the injury. Mm. Yes, physical injury, so to speak. In the wake of the last couple of conversations that have been had over the, the murders, the chief government pathologist, I saw an article that saying he was given some 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 vacation time to go and just rest and, and clear his mind because one of the cases that person was handling was so traumatic. How do you take care of yourself? You meet people, as you said, in their most vulnerable state. There's a human side of you that also is looking at a human being but linked to stay alive. Some of the cases brought to you, gunshot wounds, stab wounds, all manner of things. How do you take care of your mental health? That is, that is a very pertinent question. And I know our colleagues who are in the mental health space have it as a regulatory requirement that you must go and get counseling after you've counseled so many people because that mental anguish can be transferred to you must also go and get counseled. Now, what we do in the, in, 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 in the other disciplines that not, are not in mental health, first and foremost, is for us to be consciously aware and constantly share with colleagues. So we have confidence, we have mentors that you can share with so that they debrief you, so that they debrief you. In fact, when we have those incidents where we are resuscitating a patient, whether we succeed in our resuscitation or we lose the patient, as that team that was doing that resuscitation, there's always a step we call team debriefing because that team debriefing is important so that everyone vents out and say, I think this is where we went wrong. I think this is where we went right. And in the moment also say, this was also a very sick patient who probably was going to die nine out of 10 times. And therefore let's not beat ourselves because we have failed one out of 10 because nine out of 10, they were going to die. For if I might share my personal experience, We've, we've, we've a group or WhatsApp that we've maintained for long uh, since I was in training with my classmates then and that becomes an area where we, we constantly call each other, we constantly just vent. If you get not even a patient dying, if a patient complicates. In, in surgery we have a saying that every surgeon has a cemetery they walk to. Because there's a patient you lost and you've never gotten over it, you always think if I had held that suit a little differently, if I had gone to operate a little sooner, maybe I would have saved them. So those are skeletons in our closet. And having a, having, having a forum where we share them frequently really helps you debrief. And what I do personally is share with a few of colleagues who we are close with. Just last week, I remember a colleague calling me and just telling me I have this guy. I removed this growth on this part of the intestines. Now I think that area where I see Chad is leaking. I'm just frustrated. and just listening. It's enough. Just listening enough is enough. And that's one of the things that Atul Gawadi speaks in complications. Because what happens is the society and the rest of us place us at such a high pedestal we feel we are gods. Mm. And we are constantly feeling that the patient, come what may, we should save the patient. We don't pose and ask, the patient has such a bad disease. Evidence shows that only 
one out of 100 will recover. We want this vision to be that one, not to be the other 99. Mm. So it's also a default setting in the in the in the healthcare sector because you know you know what is the what is at at risk. What is at risk is life. It's not like uh, you will be conned of 10,000. You will be conned of a life, if I can use that term. Mm. So it, it, it is something that we're constantly discussing in conferences, in our meetings. We are constantly saying, how can we enhance physician wellness? How can we enhance surgeon wellness? I won't say we have the magic bullet, but the easiest I've found is where you have a team of colleagues that you can constantly vent to. You come to... You don't come to seek... Correction. You come to report where you feel, I feel I've failed here. And then we'll say, no, that's fine. No, in a normal situation, I would, not, I would also have done the same. Because you get so invested, you don't even think laterally. So that's one of the issues. But I, 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 I personally keep hoping that I could have something, you know, like a safe space, like the way they have Alcoholic Anonymous, <laughs> where we just meet as surgeons and share our own troubles. You know, mm. you come and say... I lost this patient, I have not gotten over it because I think I could have done this differently, differently. And we just come there purely to share our own failures, you know, yeah. because that is something that we don't celebrate, that we don't constantly discuss or something like that. But it's something that is gaining traction in terms of surgeon wellness. But that is a very, very pertinent question for you to ask. Mm. Mm. Thank you so much for making time to to speak with us. And thank you so much for enlightening us and allowing us to to, to learn from you, sharing your knowledge, the experience you've gathered, not only documenting it in a book, but also making yourself available to share it with us on this. Um, how can somebody find you and, and, and where can somebody find you? Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. It's been a pleasure to speak to you and great work you're doing. I wish you continue with the podcast and I hope to come back sooner. I, I, I practice in... PCA Kikuyu Hospital. This is next to Alliance Girls. And I run clinics there on Wednesdays. So if there's a patient who wants to come, come on a Wednesday, we will be able to review you and see you. You can engage with me online on LinkedIn, on Twitter, on Facebook. It's Dr. Stanley Aruyaru. On Instagram, it's Stanley underscore Aruyaru. Uh, drop a comment, uh, comment on any of the posts there. DM me, we'll be able to respond. And my website is www.aroyaru.com a lot of blogs that go up there depending on the things I come across on a day-to-day -day life so please interact with it drop a comment and let's see what's what's up there and I really look forward to releasing my next book so that you know we can build the conversation and we can build the culture of writing locally and having these conversations locally and pushing our local content Thank you so much. And and I want to emphasize that YouTube channel. Please check out that YouTube channel. Remind them again. What is Something it? about surgery. Something about surgery mm. is his YouTube channel. He's put some very, some of the conversations we, we touched on here. There are videos that he's done longer versions of it. And that can create a very good opportunity for us to keep interacting with that content. And as he has said, he's writing his second book and there is not any other store that has, as, as, hosted very many Kenyan authors more than Nuria. They are the premier Kenyan uh, uh, bookstore, but also they have other titles from the rest of the world, so check them out. Also feel free to visit them, as we've said, on the 11th floor of the Baza Plaza and see what they have. Um, also want to say it's been nice um, working with the Kenya National Library Service. Check out the website for Kenya National Library Service. There are a ton of services that are offered there, and it's a public uh, library, so it's open and accessible to each and every person. So figure out uh, what you can do in that space. They have a digital space. They have a children's space that has trained experts who will take care of your children. If you have a date with your kids in the library, trust you me, nobody will be disturbing you. You'll have your section seated there on the side, reading your whatever you need, it is you need to read, your kids will have somebody who will be taking care of them and what are dates to have. But also, I want to say a special thank you to each and every person who've journeyed with us uh, across the previous seasons and now as we begin a new journey on what's on your shelf. Who do you want to see on this podcast? Who do you want us to talk to? Feel free to reach out to us. Feel free to, to, to support the podcast. The details are on the screen. And, and we will be happy to continue building that culture of. Uh, uh, um, of reading 
and interacting with this. Our mission this year is to try and create uh, spaces in the informal settlements of this country, starting with Nairobi, where people can go and just read and just access information. We will be calling upon you viewers and, and supporters alike to join our hands to see what we can do for this country. For the insights that the, uh, our very able doc has given us, remember, he's an award-winning 2021 Top 40 Under 40. There's that thing on Toastmasters you mentioned. You also got a, an, an award on it. Oh, yeah. It's called a Distinguished Toastmaster Award. That's like the highest recognition in terms of... Uh, so you go through a series of you know, projects on leadership and public speaking, all that together, and then you... You, are, you attain a certain level mm -hmm. and it's like a medal like in the military so they call it DTM but even in the Toastmasters uh, you know calendar every every time there is always a public speaking competition mm -hmm. I think I have not caught for this particular season because I transitioned from Meru but every year there is always a round of competitions and you can compete all the way to be the world champion of public speaking wow. yeah so they, they are always open and people are welcome so just google it Toastmasters.org Come and then check across East Africa. If you just type Toastmasters East Africa, you'll find more than 40 clubs within Nairobi across across various points, meeting here, different different dates, different times. Uh, pop in and see what happens there. And if you like it, join. Yeah. Just just what, uh, $65 to join. And then I think $60 every six months to renew. Mm. And then you just enter into a pool of networked individuals who are driven, who want to go higher. You, you you sit there with the CEOs and there are no boundaries. You just speak. So it's a brilliant networking environment as well. Oh, mm. nice. So I think you know about that. So that is where our curtains fall for today's episodes of What's on Your Shelf. It's been beautiful to host Dr. Stanley Ariaru Mwenda, who is um, a, a doctor by training and by practice, 12 years plus, and uh, he's shared with us his wisdom and knowledge. What are you reading? What's on your shelf? I've been your host, Mulure Mike. See you on the next one.